Hi, I'm James Reinders. I'm going to cover two key concepts involved with parallelism today. They're terms that you'll hear when you start working with parallel programming, when you start looking at multi-core processors and looking at writing programs for them. And they're really important terms to thoroughly understand. They're very simple concepts, but let's go over them. The first one I'll go over today is um, task and data parallelism. What are they um, and what do they mean? And then I'll finish with talking a bit about Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law is a very interesting observation, but sometimes it's used to predict things that simply don't make sense. So I'm going to talk about those. Let's start with task and data parallelism. Parallelism is doing multiple things at once. But there are fundamentally two types of parallelism that people will talk about. One is task parallelism and another is data parallelism. Data parallelism is pretty simple. Data parallelism is the concept that you have a lot of data that you want to process. Perhaps it's a lot of pixels in an image, or perhaps it's a whole lot of um, payroll checks to update. Taking that data and dividing it up among multiple processors is a method of getting data parallelism. Um, this is an area that supercomputers have excelled at for years. It's a type of problem that's pretty well understood, and I think more emphasis has been put on data parallelism in the past than on task parallelism. Task parallelism, on the other hand, is if you have multiple tasks that need to get done, different things, um, on the same data. So perhaps you have a large data set, and you want to know what the minimum data value is, and you want to know the maximum, and you want to know the average. This is a rather trivial example, but you could have different processors each look at the same data set and compute different answers from them. So task parallelism um, is a different way of looking at things. Instead of dividing up the data and doing the same work on different processors, with task parallelism what you're doing is you're dividing up the task to apply. The most common task parallelism, though, is actually something called pipelining. And pipelining is where you have um, multiple tasks, say task one and task two and task three. And instead of having each one of them operate on the data independently, what you actually do is take the data and give it to the first task and process it, and then the second task and the third task. Image processing is often done in a pipeline fashion. Graphics processors often do pipelining. You stream an image. And some of the processing starts with the first task. A certain filter is applied, and then it's passed on and passed on and passed on. This is a very common combination of task and data parallelism that we'll see. So this takes a little getting used to. It's worth looking into and understanding where the parallelism is in your application. In reality, usually there's both types of parallelism. And as you start to look for that, and understand it, you'll, you'll figure out whether it's better to write your program for task parallelism, data parallelism, or perhaps both, perhaps pipelining. Now, with that in mind, you've got the idea you're either going to divide up your task or your data or a little of both. Um, a question becomes, how much speed up can you expect? How much performance are you going to get from these multi-core processors? There's a fam very famous observation by Gene Omdahl. It's known as Omdahl's Law. And that is that the speed up is limited by the serial portions of your program. Serial meaning the portions of your program that don't run in parallel. So let's take a look at a simple example here of a program that's got five different parts to it. And each part takes 100 units of time. In this case, let's go ahead and assume that the first, sec third, and fifth parts are serial. And we're not going to find parallelism in it. But let's look at the um, second and fourth part and assume that we're finding data or task parallelism. So initially, the program takes 500 units of time to execute. If we can change the second and third so that they only take 50 units of time because we run it on two processors, this overall program is only going to take now um, 100 less, or it's going to take 400 units of time to execute. Now that represents a 25% speed up. We can continue this, and perhaps we have four processors, and we make each one run in 25 units of time. And you can see how this progresses. We, each of these parts of the program now only take 25 units of time to execute, because we've got four processors doing the work we were doing before. 
we get the execution time of the program down to 350 units of time, representing a 40% speed up. Now the thing about Amdahl's law is, is it continues to focus on the fact that the serial portions aren't getting smaller. We can envision taking huge number of processors and making these two parts of the program roughly run in no time at all. Still, the program takes 300 units of time to run because we've left the serial portions behind. This is key to Amdahl's law. It basically says you're going to be limited by the serial portions of your code. Amdahl's law predicts for this particular simple example that no matter how many processors we have, we're never going to get more than a 70% speed up. If you take this completely at face value, um, Amdahl's law, speeding up today's programs, you can see that multi-core doesn't look very appealing. Parallelism in general doesn't look appealing. So what's going on? I mean, we've built supercomputers with thousands of processors. Clearly, Amdahl's law isn't all there is to it. Gene Amdahl came up with this observation in 1967. Surprisingly, it took quite a long time, but in 1988, Gustafsson um, pointed out something about Amdahl's law. He took a different look at it, and he said, look, computers don't do the same work year after year after year. As our computers get more and more powerful, we tend to throw bigger and bigger workloads at them, more and more data to process. And we see that today. We see computers getting um, processing HD TV images instead of small images. And we see a lot of demands on our computers. So if we take a different look at this and say our program that ran in 500 units of time, we're going to double the amount of work that we're doing in our parallel sections. And now we're actually going to get 200 units of work done in the same amount of time. The program still takes 500 units of time to execute, but we get 700 units worth of work done. And that's a 40% speed up with just two processors. And if we continue this trend and we um, add a couple more processors, each getting the same amount of work done, we can get 1,100 units of work done in 500 units of time. And that's a 2.2 speed up. Gustafsson's observation basically says, if we can keep increasing the amount of work we want to get done, which I think is the history of computing, that the serial portions actually have diminishing impact on us, and that we actually can see speed ups on the order of the number of processors that we have. So um, it may not be um, perfect use of parallelism, perfect speed up. Every processor doesn't uh, increase our speed up um, um, so that if we have 10 processors, we're not getting 10-fold speed up. But we are getting linear speed up. We can expect 20 processors to get us roughly double the performance we got with 10 processors. So if you ever hear Amdahl's law quoted as a reason that parallelism won't work out for us, you can come back and, and make the observation that Gustafsson had an explanation for what to do. And this is really a key behind why supercomputers have been successful with parallelism is that we continue to increase the data sets. The same thing will happen for multi-core processors.